to a mayoralty, but I, I do not like to support the mayoral model because of the um, concentration of power in the hands of one man. Don't mind the concentration in a man who has integrity uh, and engages and is willing to be scrutinised. But one day we will sit, sit here, perhaps we won't sit here, we will sit somewhere with a mayor that does, doesn't have any of those credentials whatsoever. So in terms of the creation, the, the uh, part of the motion, directly addressing the motion, the creation of an assembly similar to the Great London Assembly. What we need is to ensure that scrutiny of the mayor is um, real and transparent and productive and effective. I thought we'll get to that, but we have to strive that the role of our democratic mandate, um, and we, on average we speak 15,000 people in, this, in this, this, this chamber, our democratic mandate is to ensure that we scrutinise. My concern and what I've seen around mayor, mayoral models is twofold. The first one I'm particularly concerned about is what's been referred to as the mayoral plan, which is, is, it could, could come about, but it's not decided, but it's in the, it's in the ether. And the mayoral plan will, will, will vest within uh, an elected mayor the ability to be able to circumvent any policy that this chamber agrees on, effectively rendering the chamber ineffective. I wonder if you've thought about that in terms of supporting the mayorality. The other problem for me is I always wonder why George Osborne says to us, you uh, need to be compliant to what I say, but this is the model I want. Why is that? I know we'll never get power, the Conservatives will never get power again. But I do know that in this integrity of the model, the American model, and, and um, uh, elected mayors, that quite often, ultimately, and inevitably, there will be someone who comes along who's a celebrity who has lots of money behind them who will win the election. And I, I suspect that will be put someone back by the Conservative Party who will finally get power back in. In the government, so scrutiny of the mayor is, is critical. The other thing I have to say is, I mean, I think um, I, I said a number of years ago when we first looked at the mayor order model that um, the number of, of councillors would be reduced. It, 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 brothers, sisters, inevitably, that, that, that's going to happen. It's a, it's a greater scale than I, I, I imagined. The Great Manchester Authority are currently talking about, um, I'm using the analogy of um, New York, which is a legislature, remember. It has it is 14 times the size of Manchester and it has 54 councillors. Manchester has 96. So I think I was wrong by suggesting there's 30 less councillors. My point now is on 60 less councillors. That is isn't reason to, to vote against the mayorality by any means. It has to be, you vote on the basis of what's best for the city. I simply do not believe that um, divesting that much power in somebody that we don't know um, is the right thing to do unless it was. to react and react now. The first is the parliamentary bill has now left the House of Lords, it's going back to the House of Commons, where, as I said before, we will have a mayoral model imposed on us. I don't particularly like that, but I like the alternative even less. The other reason for absolute urgency is that it's not only those five collaborations, we will be the last of the major collaborations, the major metropolitan Collaborations to come to an agreement. Even Cornwall is now ahead of us in taking down devolution and powers from central government. I gather they're going to build a bloody great wall along the Tamar, not let anyone else in. Perhaps that's an idea, Joe, for across the world uh, in, in some way. But the fact is that uh, what we've heard today is just irrelevant. We know what we have to respond to. If we really wanted to discuss these issues properly, we should have been discussing them two or three years ago, because now it's too late. My Lord Mayor, last week, the entire Liberal Democrat group uh, went for an away week. We used to have an away day. <laughs> and we, had an away week. But we spent the first couple of days doing the sort of bonding and getting to know each other, <laughs> sorted, which perhaps I won't go into detail. <laughs> Uh, in an idle moment, I, I watched a television programme called Pointless. Uh, and I must say, I think the Greens in this city would be 
experts in that, because apparently you've got to do things which are pointless. You get no points for being pointless. And we've got two amendments here, which at the end of the day are very fuzzy, very nice, well-meaning, I don't particularly disagree with either of them, but they don't amount to a row of beans. They are pointless. Let's agree on what we can agree on, and let's bloody well get on with it. I actually uh, pointed out to them that there was a real serious dispute for the Democrats when the toast was burned and uh, it was so cold across the kitchen table. So uh, thank you for putting out that about that away day or the away week. It was, it was good to hear. I, I thought it would, would have been very, very easy for me or for us to amend that I was the site that, that, that uh, motion that you put forward. And you haven't because it's got good things in it. We said about the debate with the wider region. And it's important that we engage businesses and it's important that we engage, engage with each other. And then, you know, that's why we don't come to, you know, the, the, I think everybody's described it. I, I can't resist not responding to the Greens. I know everybody's kicked them, but I, I need to just kick them. So, so, you know, this 176 million pounds that, that, that the Greens would have saved us, I mean, did you live in the same world? Did you actually believe that you would have been elected to the government? Say it was that 176 million pounds. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. The way we are, if, if we were living in Greenland, <laughs> their land, like Brighton, if we'd be living in their land and accepting these two amendments, let's be clear what would happen. One is that they demanded from government the end of austerity, and we've just had an election six weeks ago that told us if I'm not having, we get an austerity whether you like it or whether you don't. But they say we should end it before we do a deal with government. That's what they say. And then they're also saying about a referendum. So two things. One, there's no provision for that in the bill. There's not at all for that in the bill. So it's not going to happen. So it's hypothetical, isn't it? And even if it was, what I suggest you do if you want that referendum is actually stand the candidate, it's a green candidate, that says we turn it back and we'll keep it as it is, then everyone should vote for them, and that will do your referendum. But the reality is the two things that you're putting forward here, and that's the seriousness of this, it's a serious point here. If they got their way with those two amendments, it would stop Liverpool moving forward. <coughs> Everybody else would move forward. But because of their two things that we should demand from government, which we're not going to get, we'd be left behind. That's the real scene. That's the absurd position of Greenland. It, it's absolutely a total, total disaster and waste of time. Martin, let me come to your points about, about and I wonder if you'd have come up with something that was lucid and absolutely pertinent in terms of the debate. I would have got you in a second, and I would have seconded it myself, and I would have got others to second it, and that's the one to support. So let's deal with what you were saying, because this ether that you're saying this uh, plan is uh, in, I wonder what you think, because you know, there may be several of us here, and I'd love to know what you think at all. But let me tell you this, let me say to you, the government are not saying to me, or to any city region, we're determined how your governance arrangements should work in relation to the constitution. So in other words, scrutiny is up to the elected representatives of that cabinet with the mayor. So you know, I have this same argument about scrutiny when we city mayor, when we had an elected, we've had more scrutiny of this council than it has ever been known before. And I'm in favour of scrutiny. And the problem is, with you, is that you think that somebody else could come over and take over as mayor. But if the performance of the, the uh, constitution, the strength of the constitution, is put in place, then that's support that that will never happen. 
And that's why, that's why I'm saying, not only will the other leaders say, but the other local authorities say, and leaders of the opposition say, that there has to be scrutiny. Of course there has to be scrutiny. And there'll also be a position where if some authorities don't want to do a deal, they don't have to. But if there is something that is fundamentally they oppose, or two of them, or, or whatever, then you can also put in place within that constitution a uh, proportionality of votes. So all of that is up to us to decide, and up to us to decide now. We've actually got two senior officers from within the city region working on those arrangements to make sure that they're open and transparent and fair and fair to everybody. So you know, I don't buy into this that it's going to be uh, an opportunity for corruption. I don't buy into this that it's going to be one man who's making those decisions. Because there will still be the quasi judicial the responsibilities of the planner. This isn't about taking powers away from each other, it's about taking powers of decentralisation away from Whitehall and the officials, and that's what you need to understand. Nobody in this city wants to run Will's Library or Crematorium in Nosley. What we want is control of the levers that will make a difference to the quality of people's lives. And if we can put a robust set of governance in place that protects the rights of people in terms of those uh, authorities and, and ourselves included in that, then that's what we should do. So, you know, don't be scared or afraid of, of what it is we have to do. Finally, you know, I actually thought, I really did, that you got this. I really did. I, I actually really thought that you got this, that you understood the situation and the challenges that we face and how we can change things in the future. By God, I tell you, you know, I wish we could film your performance in this council. And, and what, summed me, what summed it up beautifully for me is that you didn't even know how to vote an amendment before. You were having to consult with each other about what. It's madness that you are thinking of moving amendments that slow and stop the process that everybody here and everybody in the other authorities across and the vast majority of people in this city want us to do is to grab the levers of power to make a difference to people's lives in the city and you just don't get it. You just don't get it and I doubt ever whether you will. So you know, I think you just need to leave the Greens fairly where you are in Greenland. Okay, we're going to move to the vote now on 10 amendment as amended by the day. Four, four, against 72, abstention is the amendment of law. So now the substantive means.
475, one against, no abstentions. Carry on. We've got there in here. So now going back to the agenda. Item 7. Can I move the appointments outside bodies as attached in appendix? Got agreed? Item 8 agreed with both. Item 9, Council Agreed. Item 9, Council Agreed. Lord Mayor, can I move the recommendations of Constitutional Issues Committee? The 30th of July 2015 be approved. particularly in the light of what we've just been talking about with devolution, to call on uh, all the public sector agencies in the city uh, and how we can do more ourselves to increase the employment of local people uh, and contract more local businesses um, by a minimum of 10%, but definitely that we should do more. Uh, and I want to start with the budget, because I think that the national press and the media in the country and some of our leaders should be holding their heads in shame, to be honest, at the fact that they bought a press release from this government that said that the, last, that the budget was a pay rise for Britain. Because even though the minimum wage has gone up to £7.20, and of course, that's good, the fact that it introduced such draconian changes and reductions to ta working tax credits and child tax credits means that people have actually lost out. And I'll just give one example. I'll just give one example. A household that's firmly dependent on working 16 hours a week on minimum wage, yes, will have to see their income increase weekly by next April by £11 a week. Yes, they will. But when you factor in the cuts to tax credits, working tax credit and tar child tax credits, they'll lose an unbelievable £29 a week. They'll lose a net £18 or £19 a week. A thousand pounds a year. The people who are the poorest workers in the country and in our city will lose £1,000 a year. And who knows about that? Because the press have just not reported it appropriately or accurately and our people are walking into a situation next April that God knows how they're going to deal with it. And that's significant to us in this city because 21.5% of people who are working in the city earn below, already earn below the living wage. They already earn below the living wage. That's 48,000 people. 48,000 people. And when you think that they're losing on average £1,000 a year, that's £48 million that we're going to lose from, from our economy. And why is that? Because we have in the city 36% of our workers in part-time work. That's amongst the highest proportion of part-time work in the core cities in the country. And it's been largely being driven by zero hours contracts. I went down to um, Shropshire somewhere. If I remember where it was. Okay. I just sent it up so unfortunately the HR director for Marston was also in the same place <laughs> to have a meeting. About because Marston's running a uh, carvery on the East Lancashire Road and we want to want to go and talk to them because apart outside the assistant managers and the other managers and the head chefs in Marston's everybody everybody else is going to be on zero hours contract. I said, you know, it might be good for you, but we have enough of a good thing in this city. You know, we need people with reliable hours contracts on decent wages. And their answer to me was, well, but our competitors are doing the same thing. And they're right, if you go into Starbucks, you'll be served by someone who's on a zero hours contract. If you go across the road in the East Lancashire, uh, on the East Lancashire Road, you'll go to McDonald's. They'll be serving you from, uh, and they're, they're working on zero hours contracts. Go to Sports Direct and they'll be doing the same thing. 
So, although it's difficult, we have to find a way of creating the city as a living wage and a reliable house contract, it's difficult to do that. But one of the ways that we can do it is in... Yes? Okay, I apologise for that. Uh, I won't name them again. <laughs> well, not in this chamber, anyway. But the... <laughs> No, I won't. No, I, I, I promise I won't mention Starbucks, Marston's, Paul's director, and McDonald's again. The, uh, but, but, what is, but what we can do, what we can do is influence public sector spending in the city. Public sector spending, as I'm average, and I've worked it out very roughly, is about three billion pounds when we include what we spend. About three billion pounds a year. It's forty percent of people who are employed in the city are employed through public sector organisations, and we have to do more about about then employing people on a living wage, not using zero hours contracts, encouraging them to to contract with with, with supporting local businesses without unfair thresholds, and to encourage apprenticeships and training. We've set up a scrutiny panel from the Employment and Skills Select Committee to look at, at doing that, and look at all those legal and practical issues and what we can do in order to take that forward and encourage that to happen. Because that's the most important thing that we can do for our people in the city. If we're going to try and get them out of the trap and the stress and the difficulty they have in facing benefit cuts on tax credit cuts is get people on decent wages and get them as local, locally employed. And just to repeat, just to repeat, when I looked at some of the, uh, the annual reports from the universities, the police, uh, the housing associations, they don't see them reporting about what they're doing on impacting local employment and local business in the city. And I think we need to see that. And we need to do that more as well, but we need to see that. And just to repeat, all those organisations, public organisations, spend about £3 billion a year. And if we can't, in spending £3 billion a year, do more to employ local people, contract local businesses, pay living wage, and encourage more apprentices, then we are doing something seriously wrong. Important working is within 
within departments and things that we fund within Liverpool City Council when we can put social, the Social Care Act at the heart of everything that we do. And I think that the impact that race is having in our communities shows that. Thank you. Looking at my agenda, probably people are thinking, what earth is that about? I'm trying to put in there some of the real detail that we've got to have in place and we've got to have locked down so that once we've got it in there, we can put our foot down and we can motor hard, not just stay on the sidelines, but we can actually pick this up. Um, and that the, the purpose of the agenda is really to broaden the debate right out. So rather than focusing on social value act, which I know other people have, have talked about, We've already brought, uh, sorry, we're already broadening it out in terms of looking at the CAB, the welfare rights. But we need to look at the bigger picture um, and to show what we're already doing and what we can build on. Just look at the school investment um, programme, for example, I mentioned that in the addendum, um, the 12 new schools. And the targets that we set for that, which it's not here, which were very, very high, we reached and actually um, exceeded. And there are many, many other um, examples of that throughout our, our region, uh, projects going down. But the addendum shows how important all, not just some of the legislation and the procurement rules are. And it does give us hope that we as a council can make a big difference with the funds we still have. And hopefully with more levers coming in if we do actually get devolution done. Um, why do we need hope? Uh, because of people who just said before, uh, people are under incredible pressure at the moment. As we know, we've got more people in, in work poverty now than out of work poverty. Um, and we cannot lose hope in the city, which is seen to, to drain away very fast at the moment. People are getting battered from every single angle. It's not just obviously the council that's getting cut. Um, it's people, all the welfare cuts coming through. As Barry said before, this year has contracts, the umbrella um, organisations, all of those. And this is people being battered totally unjustly. Um, they have nothing to do with a banking crisis and they're having to pick up the, the fallout from that. Uh, it also shows the agenda that we can continue.